after the Philadelphia Convention, 55 men in, during all, in that meeting wrote down the U.S. Constitution with seven articles. Articles 1, 2, and 3 pertain to the branch of the government, the yeah. separation of powers. Article 4 is inter interstate relations. That's not something you need to worry about. Article 5 is the amendment process. That's part of your homework assignment. Article 6 is the supremacy clause. How there is a hierarchy of authority which puts the federal government or the U.S. government's authority over that of the state's government. We'll talk about that later on as well. Uh, last time we forgot to talk about Article 7, but that's okay. Article 7 today is a useless part of the Constitution. It did what it's supposed to do. Article 7 of the U.S. Constitution speaks or talks about how the U.S. Constitution will replace the Articles of Confederation. Once the Founding Fathers were done writing down the U.S. Constitution, it did not replace the Articles of Confederation right away. Something needed to happen in order for that to take place. And Article 7 tells us how the Constitution will be ratified. Last time, what did I tell you ratify means? To approve. Or to approve. Ratify means to approve. In order for the, for the U.S. Constitution to replace the Articles of Confederation, according to Article 7, the last article of the United States Constitution, something needs to take place, and that something is the approval of 9 out of the 13 state governments. 9 out of 13 state governments must be convinced that the U.S. Constitution is a better Constitution than that of the Article of Confederation for it to become law of the land. So after the convention, these 55 men went home to their individual states. They have one purpose now, and that is to convince their state governments that the U.S. Constitution should be ratified, that the U.S. Constitution is a better form of, uh, sets up a better form of government than the Articles did. Can anybody tell me by convincing nine out of the 13 state governments to ratify the U.S. Constitution is going to be a difficult task. This wasn't a clear-cut thing. Not everybody agreed that we needed a new Constitution. Why? What's the obstacle? Why is it going to be difficult? Go ahead. Sorry. This is more than half. It's more than half. It's a lot more than majority. Correct. What else? The states didn't trust the government. The states didn't trust the government. That's true. What do you think? What is the main difference between the two documents? Good. The balance of power. In the Articles of Confederation, who is supreme? Which government has most of the authority? The state government. In the, in the U.S. Constitution, that power will be shared between the two levels of government. The national government will be in power. But that also means the state government, the powers and authority that they used to have under the Articles of Confederation, they're going to have to give up. So by asking them to sign off in this new constitution, what are you actually asking the state governments to do? You're asking them to give up power. You're asking them to get weaker. You're asking them to give up some of the authorities and the responsibilities that they used to have and enjoy under the Articles of Confederation. So this is not going to be a easy task for, the, uh, for those 55 gentlemen to convince their states to adopt the new constitution. For about a year, there was this debate over ratification, whether or not we should stay with the Articles of Confederation or we should move on with the United States Constitution. There are two sides to that debate. Federalists and anti-federalists. Federalists and anti-federalism is a position on one question. Should we ratify the United States Constitution and move on or move away from the Articles of Confederation? If your answer is a yes, you are a federalist. If your answer is a no, you are an anti-federalist. Again, the question is, should we adopt the U.S. Constitution? Should we make it law of the land and replace the Articles of Confederation? So those that supported the new U.S. Constitution, they're known as the Federalists. Those that supported, that opposed the new U.S. Constitution are the Anti-Federalists. Anti-Federalists were scared of um, how powerful the national government is going to be under the U.S. Constitution. There were, um, disappointed in how much power the state governments will have to give up. Remember, this is one of the reasons why we fought the American Revolution in the first place. Each one of these states wanted to remain autonomous and independent, and what they saw in the U.S. Constitution is the loss of that autonomy, the loss of that independence, and the states giving up a lot of power to the national government. So a lot of people that looked at the document, they did not like it because they felt like this was something that they were fighting against when we were fighting the American Revolution. A powerful central government is going to be created. All right, on this side, 
the Federalists argued, hey, we've tried it your way. We've tried having independent sovereign states and a weak national government that loosely binds them together. That way it doesn't work. The Articles of Confederation was a disaster. We're not going to survive if we continue with the Articles of Confederation. Another big complaint the Anti-Federalists had about the new Constitution is, anybody know what it was missing? We talked about the seven articles of the, of the Constitution of the United States, right? What was missing? The Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights. We didn't have a Bill of Rights originally. When they produced the document, when they wrote the US Constitution down, the Bill of Rights wasn't there. We had to add them later on. That's why they're called what? Amendments. The first ten amendments of the Constitution are the Bill of Rights. They're the first ten additions to the Constitution. But they weren't there originally. So think about this from the anti federalist point of view. They're, they're already scared of a powerful government that the U.S. Constitution is going to create, a powerful national government. And they neglected the people that wrote the Constitution down. They felt like they neglected to provide a list of liberties and rights that this government cannot take away. A Bill of Rights acts like your shield. It protects you from the government. Whatever freedom is listed in the Bill of Rights, the government is not supposed to take away from you. But in the original draft of the U.S. Constitution, there was no Bill of Rights. So there's no protections of those individual freedoms in the anti-federalist point of view. All right. On the federalist side, though, they said, we don't need a Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights is unnecessary. Number one, most state governments already have their own Bill of Rights. So it's redundant. Number two, the Bill of Rights is actually dangerous. Anybody can tell me why. Last time we talked about how the US Constitution limits the government. Here's how the Constitution works, according to the Federalists, like Alexander Hamilton and James Madison that wanted this US Constitution to be ratified. How the Constitution works is it lists the powers that government has. It tells us what government can do, what the legislative branch, executive branch, judicial branch can do. And how it limits the government is whatever power is on that list, or whatever power is not on that list, it is implied that government cannot do it. Does that make sense for everybody? So we don't need the right to bear arms. We don't need to list that in the US Constitution because we did not give the national government the ability to take away people's guns in the first place. We don't need freedom of religion because government does not have the power to dictate what you believe. That's not one of the powers that we gave it. Actually, if we add a Bill of Rights, it's going to be dangerous. What is a Bill of Rights? It's a list of things that government cannot take away from you. What happens if you list the things that government cannot take away from you? Whatever's not on the list, what does that imply? Government can take away from you. Does that make sense for everybody? So Alexander Hamilton and James Madison say, hey, we don't need a Bill of Rights. In fact, if you add a Bill of Rights, it's going to break the Constitution. It's already limited. There's only certain powers that it cannot do. Or it can do, I'm sorry. Anyone have any questions so far? But again, there's this belief that the Federals had that we needed a stronger central government, stronger national government, and that's what's going to save the country, a more powerful, a more robust national government. All right, to convince the United States or the states, remember we need 9 out of 13 state governments to approve of it, Federalists like Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and a guy named John Jay, these three gentlemen right here were the leaders of the Federalist movement. They wrote a series of essays known as the Federalist Papers. They wrote 85 of them together. These papers, these essays were published anonymously, which means they did not put their names on the paper. And they published them all throughout the 13 states. They had one goal in mind, and that is to defend the US Constitution, to explain why the US Constitution is a better form of government, why the US Constitution should replace the Articles of Confederation. In this class, you have eight um, required documents. We've already talked about two Articles of Confederation, US Constitution, or three actually, and the Declaration of Independence. The other four, or one of the other four, are your Federalist Papers. Oh, yeah, four federal speakers. Those of you that are going to be um, lawyers someday or criminal justice, you're going to be reading a lot of these federal papers because this is where our founding fathers explained themselves the beauty of our Constitution, why the Constitution works. Oh, 
Can anybody tell me why somebody like James Madison would be on this side instead of this side? Because they both would confuse people. Sorry? It goes with the people. It goes with the people. It goes with the people. Why would James Madison be a federalist? Why would he support the U.S. Constitution? He wrote the, he wrote the damn thing. So oh. of course he's going to be on this side, right? Alexander Hamilton is one of those people that wrote it also. So he's going to be on this side. All right. The anti federals would counter with their own series of essays explaining why we shouldn't go with the U.S. Constitution. They're called and the anti federalist Papers. Again, they're just essays. Uh, the Federalist Papers defends the U.S. Constitution. The Anti-Federalist uh, opposes the United States Constitution. All right. Today, we're going to talk about some of these papers. Brutus Number 1. Brutus Number 1 is an Anti-Federalist paper. It's probably the best-known Anti-Federalist paper. So question, is it, is it written in support or in opposition of the U.S. Constitution? Opposition. In opposition of the U.S. Constitution. It laments, um, I, it disagrees with a more powerful national government that the U.S. Constitution will be establishing. You need to know the arguments. All right. He starts out with this. He cautions everybody. In the course of human history, when people give up power to a government, they rarely get that power back. So what he tells his readers is when you're deciding to sign off in this U.S. Constitution, you need to be careful because once you give up power, it's very rare that you're going to see it back. So we need to be very careful in our choice whether or not we should move on or we should stay with the Article of Confederation. So a lot of the stuff that he's going to tell you guys is exaggeration. It's like a slippery slope kind of um, kinds of arguments. But you see where he's coming from, and you see the fear and the trauma of the American Revolution behind his words. His words. All right. What he feels what the U.S. Constitution is going to do is it's going to erase the state governments, and it's going to consolidate it into one central national government. That's what he feels like. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton can pretend all they want to that state governments are going to remain and they're going to have important powers. But for him, what the U.S. Constitution is actually going to do is those state governments will be dissolved until one national government remains. Because all that power will be concentrated into the national government. So look how he starts out. The first question presents itself on the subject is whether a confederated government we had under the Articles of Confederation, where all states are sovereign, all states have independence, all states had the uh, had most of the power and authority. Be best for the United States, or, in other words, whether the 13 United States should be reduced to one great republic. Because that's what the U.S. Constitution is going to do. Should we have 13 independent states with their own autonomy, or should we reduce it into one? great national government. Governed by one legislature, one Congress, governed uh, under the direction of one executive and one judicial branch, because that's what the, the, the U.S. Constitution is going to do. It's going to reduce all of our states into one government with one Congress, with one executive branch, with one judicial branch. Or whether or not they should continue 13 Confederate republics under the direction of and control of a supreme federal head for certain defined purposes or national purposes only. All right. So here's what he fears. What he fears is the U.S. Constitution, again, is going to erase these state governments. It's going to render them basically useless and innate. And it's going to consolidate them or dissolve them into just one big government with all the power. But remember, what happens when power is concentrated is often abused. So he's, he fears the concentration of power within the national government. Now, what Madison would say, and what Fettles would say, hey, it's not like we took away all of the state government's power in the U.S. Constitution. They still have some power. They still have some authority. Buddha says, that's not true. The powers you gave to the state governments are nominal powers, powers that are not that important. Most of the important powers, like econo economic powers, military powers, 
you gave to the national government. So what you're actually doing is you're erasing the state governments and dissolving them into just one big government. What he prefers is what we had under the Articles of Confederation, where each state had power, each state could make their own decisions, each state had, can make their own policies, bound together by a national government that can only make decisions about certain things. A confederacy, the Articles of Confederation. All right. There are other complaints about the U.S. Constitution, and in these complaints, guys, he's going to be right, but he goes too far. But it's some of these complaints. Some of these complaints. His intuition is going to be correct in some of these. All right. So one of the things that we fought the American Revolution for is taxation. All right, taxation without representation. Right. In this new Constitution, the national government will now have the ability to tax, which is something that scared a lot of Americans back then. Because remember what happened with Britain. So this is the sentence in the U.S. Constitution that gave the U.S. government, specifically the legislative branch, the ability to tax. So I want you to follow along with me. Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare. His problem is this phrase right here, general welfare. Welfare means well-being. To him, that's too vague. To him, that means the U.S. Congress, the United States government, if they can reason, hey, this is going to be good for the country, then they can impose a tax for it. So this will allow the United States Congress to tax the American people for pretty much whatever reason that they see fit. As long as they can justify, hey, maybe the government, the, the country will be better for it, they can tax us. This gives them unlimited tax powers. The vagueness of the wording gives the United States government unlimited taxation powers. Rather than being able to tax for certain reasons only, like a military or paying for the debts, this phrase right here allows the United States government to tax for whatever reason that they see fit, because it's too vague. Does that make sense for everybody? Next, this is one that he's going to be right about. Congress has the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. This is called the necessary and proper clause. So Hamilton and Madison can say all they want, according to Bruce, that the powers of the U.S. government are well defined, that Congress can only make laws about certain things, about certain policy areas. But look at what it says here. Congress can make any law that is what? Necessary and proper. As long as they can reason that it is a necessity and it is proper, then they can make a law about it. I'll give you an example. Congress in World War II authorized the Manhattan Project that dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan. Is the power to create a nuclear bomb in the U.S. Constitution? No, it's not there. But Congress can reason, hey, we're at war. It is necessary and proper to create weapons that would help us win the war. This is what that sentence does. Rather than Congress being limited and bound by what the Constitution says, it allows Congress to go beyond what the Constitution says. Because if they can reason something is necessary and proper, then they'll be able to make a law about it. They can make a decision or a policy about it. Again, the vagueness is what he's complaining about. Next. You should be familiar with this one. What article of the Constitution is this? Promise Clause. What are articles of the Constitution? SSS. Article 6. Article 6 of the Constitution. Now, this, he actually has a really uh, strong issue with. The issue is, hey, if you say that federal authority is supreme over state authority, then why have state governments at all? If every single time a state wants to do something, and all the federal government has to do is contradict that thing, why have state governments at all? If state power, if federal power oversees or supersedes that of state power, then why have state governments at all? If federal law is supreme over the state uh, over state law, why have state governments at all? Because again, he wants to protect state power, he wants to protect states' rights, and he feels like the Supremacy Clause of the United States will render state governments useless. 
because whatever whatever they want to do, if the national government doesn't want to do it, the national government will be supreme. That's what the supremacy clause states. All right, more objections. Be scared that this new national government is able to raise a centralized military. Oftentimes in history, uh, standing army is a threat to people's liberty, is a threat to people's rights. Look at what happened with the British. They used their standing army during peacetime to violate people's rights. The judicial branch being able to overrule state courts, national courts being able to overrule state court decisions. That's also something that he disagrees with. Again, the central thesis of this, the central argument is this proposed constitution creates a central government that will make state governments useless, that would make them obsolete. They don't have autonomy anymore. They don't have the independence anymore. They don't have power anymore. Because if the government, if the central government can just overrule them each and every time, then why have them at all? They're obsolete now. If we adopt this US Constitution, say goodbye to your state governments. They'll be there, but they'll be useless. All right. This is probably his main argument here, number two. This is the one I need you to focus the most on. If we are going to give up power, according to Brutus, to a government, what type of government do we want to give up power to? Do we want to give up power to a large republic, or do we want to give up power to a small republic? Now, these are euphemisms. She's correct. She, he's going to say, he's going to conclude that small republics are better than large republics. So we have, if we're going to give up authority, if we're going to give up power to a government, we want a small government, not a large government. But these are euphemisms. Large republics refers to which government? Uh, a national government, a government that controls a huge amount of area and a huge amount of people. The national government. So the U.S. government. Small republics are which governments? States. states. Small republics control a smaller area and a smaller amount of people. States. So the question is, if we are going to give up power to a government, which government should we give up power to? Obviously, he's going to want to say that small republics are better than larger republics. You need to know the arguments. Number one, history, he says, is on his side. Over times, small republics start like Athens or Rome. And things go well. Democracy is preserved. Democracy is protected. The rights of the people are protected. And then those small republics begin to expand, and they conquer more people, and they conquer more and more people. What happened to the Roman Republic? Those of you that remember big. from world history. What happened to Roman democracy? As it fell to tyranny, Julius Caesar, Roman Empire, not a republic anymore. It fell to tyranny. That's what happens to large republics. It's okay for republics to exist in a small amount of area and that governs a small amount of people, but when those republics begin to expand and rule more people and rule more areas, they often just come to tyranny. Just like what happened to Rome, just like what happened to Athens. All right, but here is the one that you need to remember for this argument. Small republics provide better representation for its people. Small republics provide better representation for its people. The, the people, the politicians, or the people that are in government can better represent their constituents, the people of their country, or the people that they rule, in smaller republics. All right, follow along maybe. Look at the board. Imagine this is a large republic, right? Many more people. These are your representatives in government. This is a small republic, smaller amount of population, less area. These are your representatives. Which one of these representatives can be more in line or in tune with what their people want, what their people need, what are the interests of their people? Small republic. Because it's easier to know 
what the people that you represent need, want, what are they interested in, because there's, there's, a, there's fewer of them. So you can better make decisions um, that represent those interests, that represents those wants and needs. But once you start expanding and you have a larger republic, like what the U.S. Constitution is proposing, representatives are going to have a harder time knowing what the people want, what the people need, what the people care about, and making policies that address those issues. Because there's just so many more people. Does that make sense for everybody? And no one confused. So let's say I'm your representative. If I represent three people, it's going to be very easy for me to know what you guys want, what you guys need, so that I can make decisions that would address those issues. But if we expand the government to everybody here, it, I'm going to have a hard time, a harder time knowing what you all want, what you all need. I'm going to have a hard time representing what you care about. Does that make sense? It's just numbers. It's just math. Representation is going to be easier. People, uh, representatives are going to be more in tune with the people that they represent in a smaller republic. All right. Next, smaller republics are more democratic people have more influence over their representatives in a smaller republic. If there are only three of you in a republic, then you have more influence over me, because you don't have to compete with everybody else for influence over me. But if I'm representing 20 people, you have to compete with 19 other people for influence over me, to con control over me and my decisions. So smaller republics are more democratic. People have more control, they have more influence over their representatives in a smaller republic than in a larger one. Because in a larger one, you have to compete with all these people, you have to compete with all these interests for government influence. All right, next, corruption. Because people have more control over their representatives in a smaller republic, Again, they don't have to compete with a lot more with a lot of people for influence over government. And geographically, right? Which one are you closer to? Your government in your US government in Washington, DC, or your state government in Austin? State government. Or your state government in Austin. We have more control over our representatives in a smaller republic. We have more influence over them. So we can make sure that they don't become corrupted with power. But in a larger republic, we have less influence over our representatives. We have less control over them. Number one, we have to compete with other people for, for influence. And number two, they're more far away. They're further away than our, our state governments. So we have less control over them. So it's more likely for these representatives to be corrupted by power in larger republics and become tyrannical. Does that make sense? Anyone confused by that? That's why, if we're going to give a power, it's better to give it up to a smaller republic, like state governments, like what the Articles of Confederation did, than what the U.S. Constitution is going to do, which is give a power to a large republic, to a national government, with all that power. Representatives are not going to know what the people want. Representatives will be corrupted by power, because people have less control over them. They have less influence over them in a larger republic. Any questions? Next. Smaller republics, their governments function better. Smaller republics, policy making is better. Policy making is more efficient, policy making is better. Here's why, guys. Look at the board again. In which republic, are there more interests? Are there more groups vying for government control? Large or small one? Large. In a larger republic, like in America, there's a lot. Uh, there's a there's more diversity of interests. People that care about taxes, people that care about abortion, people that care about guns. There's more interests in a larger republic because there's more people. It's just math. People are less in tune with one another. They have le they have less things in common with one another. In a smaller republic. People are more in line, people are more similar, there's less interest. What does that mean? In a large republic, according to Brutus, there's always this constant clashing of opinions. There's always this constant debate. Because there's so many more interests, there's so many more groups trying to influence the government, 
there's a lot more debating going on. There's a lot more clashes of opinion. And as a result, government has a harder time making decisions. Government has a harder time making policy. Because it's slowed down by this constant debate, this constant clashing, this vigorous debate that happens in a larger republic. Because there's so much more interest. There's so much more concerns. In a smaller republic, people uh, agree with each other more. They have more similar needs. They have more similar concerns. Like, for example, Texas. What do we care about here? We care about barbecue, guns, and football, right? We have more similar things that we have in common. Which means our government will operate better because it's not slowed down and bogged down by constant clashing of opinion. That makes sense for everybody. So policy making, government operations is better in a smaller republic because the people that government represents have more things in common. There's less diversity of opinions and issues and concerns. In a larger republic where there's more diversity of issues, concerns, and interests, Government is slowed down by constant argument, by constant debate between all these competing interests. Which means it's harder for them to make policy, it's harder for them to make decisions. That's why smaller republics are better. That's why state governments are better. Any questions? Look what he says here. In a republic, the manners, sentiments, and interests of the people should be similar. If this not be the case, there will be a constant clashing of opinions and the representatives of one part will be continually striving against those of other. This will retard, retard means slow down, the operations of government and prevent such conclusions as will promote the public good. It will prevent decisions that would promote the public's interests. All right, before we move on from Bruce. Does he think highly of elite democracy? No, no. Because remember, he, what he fears is in this U.S. Constitution, in this large republic, the representatives are, are going to be less in line with the people that they represent. The people will have less control over them, like in an elite democracy, right? What does he think about pluralism? Does he like that? Does he like different interests competing against each other for government um, control, for government influence? No, because what he feels like, what's going to happen? They're not going to make decisions. It's going to be it's going to be harder for government to make decisions. If you have all these groups competing for government influence, it's harder for government to get the job done. What ha what he actually likes is participatory democracy, giving the people power, giving them influence over the government. That's what he feels like happens in a smaller republic where people are closer to their government, people have more control over their government, they have more influence over the decisions that their government makes. So, he has a negative view of elite democracy, negative view of pluralism, but a positive view of participatory democracy. All right. So when you're using your these documents on an essay, Buddhist number one is great when you're trying to support state power, states' rights, when you're trying to argue against a powerful national government um, when you're trying to argue for more democracy, participatory democracy, right? Rudis number one is very good for that. All right, next. Here's a question. Which institution of the U.S. Constitution would he probably be okay with? If he's not good with elite democracy, he doesn't like pluralism, but he does like participatory democracy, he probably hates the national government that the U.S. Constitution created, right? But which part of the national government would you think he'll be okay with? The executive? The House of Representatives. Why? Because it's the only one that who has direct control over. The people. The people have direct control over it, right? Because we directly elect our House of Representatives members even from the very beginning. So he'll be okay with that. He won't be okay with the presidency, the judicial branch, the Senate, because those are out of our direct influence. Those are out of the direct control. Another question. Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, which is the amendment process. Do you think someone like Brutus would be okay with Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution? Uh, no. Alright. Let's review Article 5, right? Let's do 
steps, proposal, ratification. Two thirds of Congress or two thirds of states can propose an amendment, and then in order for it to be added to the U.S. Constitution, it needs to be ratified. Ratified by whom? How many of the states? Three fourths of the states. Would he be okay with that or not okay with that? He'll be okay with that because he likes what? He likes states. He likes state powers. He likes giving more authority to the state government. So he'll probably be okay with Article 5 of the U.S. He probably hates most of it, but Article 5 he'll probably be okay with. Yes, ma'am? Well, wouldn't it be too hard for an amendment to be passed so he wouldn't like that it's so hard to make changes so really you don't have that much power over it? I think his main concern is state power, right? He, he prefers the state governments over the national government. And what Article 5 does is it gives the state government um, the final say in whether or not something gets added or not. All right, let's go to your next one. Again, let's review. Representation is better in a smaller republic. Representation is more like, uh, representatives are more likely to be corrupted in a large republic. The diversity of interests in a large republic is a problem for him because it feels like that would slow down government. Any questions about that? All right. Next is Federalist Number Ten. Federalist Number Ten was written by James Madison anonymously. Federalist Number Ten is all about factions. Factions are a group of people bound together by a common cause. A group of people bound together by a common cause. And sometimes that cause may be to violate the rights of others. Not all the time, but sometimes that concern or that cause that they're interested in is taking away people's rights. He says, the downfall of most societies is that one faction, usually the majority faction of an issue, becomes too powerful and it becomes too tyrannical over the other factions. So the downfall of democracies usually is one faction becoming too powerful, too influential, and becoming too tyrannical over other factions. All right. Now, there's two ways to combat, to fight against this, what he calls the violence of factions, the mischiefs of factions, the tyranny of factions. Number one, remove the causes of factions. Take away what allows factions to exist in a society. Number two, control the effects of factions, mitigate the effects of factions. All right, he said there's, there are two causes of factions. Number one, people have similar beliefs. I'm sorry, people have different beliefs. We have different things that we care about. That's why different factions exist. Number two, freedom. The freedom to gather together, freedom of assembly, the freedom to petition the government, the freedom of speech. This allows factions to exist. If, faction, if everybody has to shut up, if everybody can't form groups, then factions won't exist. So the two causes of factions is people have diverse opinions and freedom. He says, hey, if we make everybody believe the same way, there will be no factions. But that's not realistic for human beings. So that's not an option for us. Another option is we take away people's freedom. If we take away people's freedoms, there will be no factions. If people are not allowed to speak out, if people are not allowed to petition their government, if people are not allowed to assemble together, then factions won't exist. But Madison says, the cure is worse than the disease. If you're trying to cure the effects of the of factions, the problem that we have with factions by taking away people's rights, by taking away people's liberty, then the cure is worse than disease. So that's not an option either. There's only one thing that we can do. We have to allow factions to exist. We just have to deal with it. Which means, this is the only thing that we can do. We have to control the effects of factions. And a good government is a government that does exactly that control, limit the effects of factions. So what he's basically saying is, my constitution, the constitution that they wrote in Philadelphia, this is exactly what it does. It controls the effects of factions. It makes sure that not one faction become too powerful or become too tyrannical over those in the weaker factions. All right, so the conclusion is, design a system that will control the effects of factions. 
So how do we do that? All right, pedals number 10, guys. If nothing else, here's what you need to remember. To control factions, we need a large republic. To control factions, we need a large republic. That's what the U.S. Constitution sets up. A national government. A large republic that has a lot of power. All right, guys. He makes two arguments. He says we have the choice between two types of democracies to um, establish in the United States. What are two types of democracy? We have pure democracies, direct democracies, and we have republican democracies. Remember, his answer to all this is a large republic. So obviously, he's going to argue for what? A direct democracy or a republic? A republic. So what is his argument against direct democracies? In a direct democracy where people themselves make the decisions, who always wins? Who always gets what they want? The people. The people, which people? The majority. The majority of every issue will always get what they want. Even if that thing that they want will be taking away people's rights or taking away the minority's property, they will obtain that thing because they're the ones with direct power. It's easier to control the wills of the majority. Why? Because people themselves do not make the policy directly. Instead, who makes those policies? representatives, people like Joe Biden, people like your senators, people like your House of Representative members, or governors, or mayors, or school your school board council, they're the ones that make the policy. If the majority's will is to take away people's rights or take away people's property, the representatives will not let that happen. So there's two advantages to having a republic, number one. People themselves don't make the decisions. People might be stupid, and they might make the wrong decisions. In a republic, we select people who are the best of us to make those decisions on our behalf. That probably means that they're going to make better policies because we select the best of us um, to be our representatives. Number two, it controls the majority. It controls their passions. It controls their will. Because if the majority wants to take away people's rights, if the majority wants to take away people's property, there is a stopgap. The representatives of a republic will not let that happen. So, it results in better policies and people's liberties and properties are protected by representatives. Sure, most of the time, the representatives will do what the majority wants them to do. But if that thing that the majority wants them to do is to take away people's rights and take away people's properties, then the representatives, according to Madison, will stop that from happening. They won't allow that to happen. So in a republic, the minority's rights, the minority's property are better protected than the direct democracy where the majority always gets what they want. Make sense? Anyone confused? All right. But he doesn't stop there. Oh. What does this suggest to you guys? Given two choices, elite democracy or participatory democracy, which one would Madison probably prefer? Elite. Giving a lot of influence to the people or giving it to a few amount of people? Elite. elite democracy, right? We're not done yet, right? He makes two arguments. He says the best way to control the effects of factions is large republic. So he argued for a republic. Now he has to argue that it needs to be what? What kind of republic? Large. Large. Right. We have two choices of a republic, state government or the national government, large or small republic. So he makes his argument for large republics. Remember, Brutus is for small republics. Battles number 10 with Madison is for a larger republic. All right. So he makes his argument. Again, like in Brutus, he agrees with Brutus. Hey, you're right, Brutus. In a larger republic, there's going to be more interests, there's going to be more groups that are trying to compete against each other for government influence. And you're right, in a small republic, there's going to be less. And government can probably function better because people are more in agreement with each other. It's very easy to reach a majority and be able to make a decision in a smaller republic. You're right. That's why the Constitution is so great. I agree with you. Here's what happens, he says. In a small republic where there's less interest, where people have more things in common, it's very easy to come to a majority. And if that majority will 
is to take away people's rights and to take away people's property. That's what's going to happen. The difficulty of forming majority, the difficulty of government making policy in a large republic is not a detriment, it's an asset. Because it makes it harder to form majorities, it makes it harder to take away people's rights and to take away people's property. It makes it harder for one group, especially the major a majority, from coming to power, influencing government too much, and becoming tyrannical over the other groups. The diversity of opinions in a large republic is an asset. Because it makes it harder for majorities to form, it makes it harder for one group, one faction, from becoming too powerful or too influential and becoming too tyrannical over the lesser groups, the minority groups. Again, it's all about controlling the effects of factions. It's all about control, making sure that not one faction becomes too powerful or too influential. And he believes a large republic and the vigorous debate that happens in a large republic with all these interests vying for, for government influence is a good thing because it prevents one group from becoming too powerful. It's not easy to form a majority in a large republic. Anyone, anyone have any questions over that? All right, next. In a large republic, representatives are better. Representatives are smarter. Representatives are uh, more qualified. Tell me why. Because there are people who compete with them. True, yes, you're right. In a large republic, you have more choices, right? There's a larger pool of people. So it's more likely that representatives are going to be better. In a smaller republic, there's less people to choose from. There's less people running for office. So it's less likely to find qualified representatives. So he's saying, in a large republic, you're getting the best of the best. In a small republic, your representatives may be, may be what you settled for because there's not a lot of uh, there's fewer people in a smaller republic. Right? In a large republic, you get the best of the best. In a smaller republic, you settle for your representatives because there's not a lot to choose from. So, representation, representatives in the large republic are better. They're more qualified. They're smarter. They're more knowledgeable because they're choosing for my bigger pool of people. Oh, by the way, before we end today, when he says, hey, all these groups existing in a large republic competing against each other, counterbalancing one another, right? What democracy is he arguing for? Pluralism, right? Having all these groups compete, having all these groups buy for government influence. That's what he's arguing. All right, guys. Battles number 51 we'll talk about on Monday. Don't worry about your quiz, guys. Um, We'll try to take it Monday, uh, but if we can't take it on Monday, don't worry. Those of you that wrote down like um, your written notes, I'll give you some extra credit if you bring them in on Monday. So bring them in anyway on Monday if you have them. If you didn't study for your quiz.